Kim, I remember the first time that Randy and I met, I shared a little bit of my testimony, and um, we was out eating, and, you know, I have a big, 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 huge testimony of just life that I've lived, you know, even up to 16, so much life that I've lived, probably more than most people have ever lived in their whole life, and, and I remember Randy saying, uh, I don't even feel like I have a testimony, <laughs> you know, I don't know if you remember that or not, but it was kind of those, those words, but he does have a testimony. He does have a heart on fire for Jesus. I've watched him and I've seen it. I've seen his heart for people and I know that, that he has a heart for the message that God has put on his heart today. So without further ado, I want to give him all the time we can give him. Randy, would you come up and give us a word for today? Thank you very much. What a privilege and an honor. Jason and I are kind of reversing roles today. I usually come out and give the charge and he brings the message, but what a privilege it is to speak to you today. What an honor it is. Thank you, that was some awesome worship. The oldies, oh my goodness, melted my heart. Thank you. Happy Father's Day. Amen, happy Father's Day. I got the privilege of having my grandson here today. Israel, stand up, bud. Stand up. He's gonna spend the week with us. Pappy gets to impart a bunch more stuff in his life, and he's like, oh, no, here we go again. But it's a joy. My son just went home. He flew home a couple, two, three days ago. But we've had the privilege when Carlene spoke on Mother's Day to have the kids with us, and now I'm privileged on Father's Day to have my grandson. So... Father's Day, hallelujah. Let me give you a little bit, a tidbit of trivia here. Father's Day in the United States. Holiday on the third Sunday in June to honor fathers. Credit for originating the holiday is generally given to Sonora Smart Dodd of Spokane, Washington, whose father, a Civil War veteran, raised her and her five siblings after their mother died in childbirth. She is said to have the idea in 1909 while listening to a sermon on Mother's Day. Good things always follow a mom, you know, which at the time was becoming an established holiday. Local religious leaders supported the idea, and the first Father's Day was celebrated on June 19th of 1910. The month of Dodd's father's birthday. In 1924, President Calvin Coolidge gave his support in, to the observance, and in 1966, Lyndon Johnson proclaimed that day to be recognized. But it wasn't until 1972 when Richard Nixon. Some observances of the custom of wearing a red rose to indicate the ones of the fathers that are living and a white rose of the ones that are deceased. This is my, my third Father's Day without my dad, and it's hard. And it's the fifth one for Carlene. And it's been tough for us, but you know what? They left us a legacy. They left us an example to follow. They led us. They corrected us. Oh, man, a lot of other things, too. But there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about my dad and the influence that he's had in me. And I'm the man today because of that. Not only him, my heavenly father. 
So all you dads today, God bless you. God bless you, man. God bless you. you got a tall order. We've got a tall order as men to impart to our kids, to impart to our coworkers, to impart to those that are all around us. So as I was praying about it, you know, Jason asked me, you want to share on Father's Day? And I said, hmm, I can give him an answer right then. But at the prayer meeting on the Wednesday night, he asked me on a Sunday. On Wednesday, I was like, yeah. And that night on the way home, the Lord dropped into my heart what he wanted me to speak on. I want to talk to you today about what is a father. Now we go and we can Google that. And it tells us all kinds of things about a father. You know, everything from a good coach to a lover to a provider. And the list goes on and on and on. But I want to know what the Word of God says about being a good father. And I believe the Lord's dropped three main things in my, in, in my heart about what a good father is. First of all, I'm a guy who likes statistics and stuff like that. So... It's mentioned 347 times in the New Testament, the word father. 347 times. And of those 347 times, only one is a different Greek word. The Greek word is pater, P-A-T-E-R. The only exception is found in Hebrews 7-3 where it's talking about Melchizedek who had no origination. They don't know his lineage. But of those 347 times, 346 times, it's the same word, pater. And of those, 123 times it's mentioned in one book. Can you guess what book that is? John the Beloved in the book of John. So... Before I get started here and get out of the gate, I just want to speak. Holy Spirit, I ask of you, I've prepared and done all that I can do to bring this message. Now it's up to you. And I'm just relieved at that. I don't have to sweat it. Lord, I just give you praise that it's a privilege, Lord. It's a privilege, Father. You are the fire. I'm just the messenger. Lord, the word's in my heart and I speak it forth. Lord, you said in your word, God. your power over this congregation that you heal hearts Lord that you mend things Lord that may be broken for years God that you reconcile differences in our life and Lord that you be exalted today that you be lifted up high because that's why we're here you are the ultimate father Lord and we love you for that and I speak that in the name of Jesus today amen Amen. Pater, P-A-T-E-R. Listen to this. It means father. Men, this is who you are. One who imparts life and is committed to it. A progenitor, begetter, originator. One in intimate connection and relationship. Bringing into being to pass on the potential of likeness. Woo. Goes on. The use of the word heavenly father means he imparts life. From physical birth to eternal life through the second birth, regeneration, being born again. Through ongoing sanctification, the believer more and more resembles their heavenly father. In other words, each time we receive faith from him and obey it, it results in a unique glorification that we become more and more like him. 
Amen. That's what the Greek word father means today. Hallelujah. Amen. So as I was asking the Lord, there's so many characteristics and traits about our Heavenly Father. I said, Lord, how do I narrow it down to just a few? And God, has, God, He is, He just dropped them right in my spirit. So I picked out three in honor of the Father and the Son, Holy Spirit, to just pass on to you characteristic traits of our Father and you fathers. And ladies, you're not excluded from this. This is part of all of who we are. We're all part of these characteristic traits. So if you're ready, I'm ready to impart the word to you this morning. First characteristic trait, first thing of what is a father, he's a provider. Twenty-two, one through 14 this is the story of Abraham being tested by God. He has to take his son, the son of promise, the only son that he has of promise that he's waited for for an extended period of time. And oh, God wants you to go sacrifice him. Listen to this. I'm going to point some things out here. Sometime later, it says, God tested Abraham and said, Abraham, he said, I am here, he replied. God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him as a burnt offering on the mountain that I will show you. Now get this. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. Now, how many of you could have slept through the night if God told you to go sacrifice your son? But yet, Abraham did. He got up the next morning. He loaded his donkey. He took with him two servants and his son Isaac. When he saw the place there, he told his servants, stay here with the donkeys while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. He prophesied right there. He had enough faith to know that God was going to have to provide something because he had the promise that that was the son of promise. And he knew even though in the natural, and I want to say to you today, things are going on in your life in the natural, but he had the promise of God, knowing that he was going to return with Isaac. So Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. Remember, Isaac was the son of promise, or he was the son of promise. I remember another son of promise that carried the wood on his back. This is kind of a foreshadow of Jesus. So he placed the wood on his back and he himself, Abraham, carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them went together, Isaac spoke. Now the kid's starting to wake up here. Hey dad, I see the wood and I see the fire, but uh, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? 
Think about this, provider, source. Abraham said, listen to this, talking about a faith-filled man, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went together. Now keep in mind, he's still under the direction to sacrifice him. But he's also saying in his spirit that there's going to be a provision because he knew the promise. His son was the son of promise. So they reached the place where God had told them. Abraham built the altar and arranged the wood on it. He even bound Isaac and laid him on the altar. Now this is getting real, folks. And he laid him on top of the wood. And just as he reached for his knife to fulfill what God said, to slay him, the angel of the Lord said, Abraham, wait. Don't lay a hand on the boy. Don't hurt him in any way. For now I know that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And at that point in his faith walk, the Lord provided a ram in the thicket. He provided for him. Now God took Abraham to the brinking point. I'm not saying he'll always do that with us, but I'm telling you what, there's been some things in my life that I felt like he's taken me to the brinking point where I was just ready to just thrust the knife down. But he's always been there for me as a provider, as my source. What I want to point out in this story is that Abraham called that place Jehovah Jireh, my provider. I want to say to you today, fathers, you are a provider. You are. You're a provider. Kids look to you. Wife looks to you. But you have to keep this in mind. You may be a provider, but God is your source. God is your source, and you always got to keep that at the forefront of your thinking. He's our source of life. Like I said there in Peter, he's our source of life. He's our begatter. He's our glorifier. He's our intimate father. People, a lot of times, they'll switch back and forth. One minute they'll trust God, next minute they'll trust man, and then back and forth. And I know that grieves the heart of God. Think about how precious this thing of provision is. Do you realize God took an entire nation of Israel? He pulled them out of slavery and bondage. He pushed them out into the wilderness. And you know why he did that? Listen to this. He took them out in the wilderness to transition them from the government being their source to God being their source. Everything that they did out in the middle of the desert, they had to totally rely upon the Lord. Everything. And did God the Father provide for them? Yes. Let me give you a couple examples of how he provided for them. He made them cross a Red Sea on dry land. Completely dry land. He gave them a cloud by day and fire by night. When they needed a drink of water, he threw a piece of wood in the water and the bitter's waters became sweet. When they were hungry, quail and manna rained from heaven. When they were thirsty again, Moses smashed his staff against a rock. Water gushed out. When they needed healing, he raised up a serpent on a pole and they gazed at it and they were not affected. They were healed. And lastly, when they entered up through the promised land, once again, as soon as Joshua's foot touched that river, it parted. Now, is that a providing God or what? Again, guys, you may be the provider, but God is our source. 
always recognize that he is our source, our everything. Another story I want to share with you is found in 2 Kings. It's a short story, but it's a powerful one. It's about the man, Elisha, who tells the widow woman, hey, she cries out to him and says, Elisha, my husband is dead. Her provision is gone. And in those days, the man was the provider. Plain and simple as that. My provision is gone. Elisha said, bring it here. You may not have a lot to offer, but if you got something, God can take what little you have and multiply it over and over and over again. Remember, provider, source. So Elisha said, go, get as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors, and then go into the house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour the oil in the flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it is filled. Talking about prophetic words. So when she did this, her sons kept bringing jars, jar after jar after jar, and they were filled one after another. Soon every container was filled to the brim. And he said, go take that now, sell it. You and your sons live out your days. He gave them a retirement plan there. And just one act of God, Elisha was pointing her. Her husband was her provider. Now God was her source. Just like you, you may not have a lot to offer. You may only have a couple bucks to put in the offering each payday doesn't matter. This woman only had a flask of oil and God gave her an entire retirement in one setting. That is the source and the heart of our father as a provider. That is who he is. Let's shift over to the New Testament. Jesus in Matthew 14 with the five loaves and two fishes. Once again in verse 19 Jesus looked up toward heaven and he blessed it. And what happened? It multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied until there was more left over than what was initially given. What Jesus was doing there was saying, Our Heavenly Father is your source and your provider. Fathers today, you are a provider, but God is your source. God is your source. Amen. Number two, and what is a father? A father is a protector. He's a protector. I bet there's not one single parent in here or father, mother, or even brother, or sister. If somebody tries to do harm to your family, your kids, that you would not do anything within your power to stop somebody from doing that. You're daggone right. Think about the animal kingdom. Think about how aggressive parents are with their young cubs and things like that. They will tear you up. <laughs> they will tear you up, man. What lengths God will go for you as a protector? As a protector. Fathers, you're a protector today. Listen to this. Almighty Wikipedia here says uh, 
the title of a father, capitalized, it says, signifies God as the role of life giver, the authority, and powerful protector. Our Father's a, an awesome protector today. In the scripture, the Hebrew word for God, Megan, M-A-G-E-N, it's used 63 times in scripture and it says, the Lord my shield, my protector. That's who he is. The names of God are just so important to us. Jehovah Megan, my protector. Do I got a scripture to go with this? Absolutely. Let's turn over to Psalms 91. Now, I don't know about you. This Psalm, I looked up a lot of scriptures for protection. And this Psalm here has to be one of the most protective chapters in the entire scripture. I read that with a protection mentality in mind. Listen to this. Oh, hallelujah. Those who live in the shelter. Times in that chapter, the Lord puts his protection over us. He's got his wings around us. We shelter under them. He's our refuge. He's our strong tower. He's our mighty God. He's our protector today. Hallelujah. That is good news. We've got this psalm posted on our refrigerator. We've got it in the back garage. It is just a psalm of protection. And that's the word of God for you today. He is our protector. There's one more. And probably this is the most important one. What a father is. Everything stems from this. Everything we do has to be part of us. If we don't have this, we're absolutely nothing. Lastly, a father is love. He's love. Love is so important to the Lord. It is probably the most defining description of what our Father is. If you go to 1 John 4 and 8 and 16, what's at state? God is what? 
That's right. God is love. That is the defining quality and characteristic of our Father. And fathers today, that has to be the defining quality and character of who you are in your household. Everything we do has to stem from love. Everything. Every single thing. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. Now this is interesting. I was reading this. He doesn't start off by telling us what love is. He goes, he tells us basically what it's not. Listen to this. It says, if I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, but I don't love each other, I would be nothing more than a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Listen to all the extremes he goes through here. If I have the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans, and I possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move a mountain, but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor, and if I even sacrificed my body on the altar, yeah, I could boast about it. But if I didn't have love, I would profit nothing. That's extremes. That's extreme. Matthew 22, Jesus approached by the Sadducees, trying to trick him again like they've been, they tried to do all along. Teacher, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said, hey, I'll give you two of them. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And oh, by the way, Love others as yourself. The entire law and all its demands of the prophets are based upon these two commandments. No matter what you do in the kingdom, everything has to stem from love. Fathers, I can't encourage you enough to love your wife, to love your children, to be vulnerable with them, to pour your hearts out to them, to exhibit love, to tell them you love them. A lot of fathers think, well, I bring a paycheck home, that's, that's my love for them. Tell them. Tell them. Sow love and you'll reap love. And everything you do, love them. Lay your hands on them. Exhibit some PDA. She doesn't like that. Love them. I want to read something to you here. About Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God and the exact representation of God's nature. The nature of the Father is the same as that of Jesus. He is love. And because God is love, everything he does is out of his love for us. We don't have to perform for him or live a life of perfection in order to gain his approval. Even when we sin, Father still loves us. And he longs to be the one to whom we run to for comfort and forgiveness. God is love and his love perfectly cast out all fear. Everything Jesus did on earth, including his sacrificial death on the cross, shows us the heart of the Father, a heart of love and compassion, not one of judgment and wrath. That's who our Father is. Scripture tells us that Paul said, 
be imitators of me as I'm imitators of God. Fathers, today love well. Love well. Oh. So at this point, I got to ask you, how do we get to that point to where everything we do flows out of love? That's a tall order. Everything has to flow out of love. How do we get there? Well, one way I know is search the scriptures out. Let me give you an example. Scriptures that talk about the Father's love for us. Jeremiah 31.3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. With unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. Other examples include Galatians 5.22. The Holy Spirit has been placed within us as a down payment of our salvation. He's not only there for that, He bears fruit in our life. And what's the first characteristic of the Holy Spirit's fruit? Love. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. That's who you are. That's who He is within you. So the pressure's not all on us, guys and gals. This is just not a men's only sermon. He's provided us our source with all of these things that we need to flow in this love. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, first and foremost. Romans 5.5, 5, we know how dearly God loves us because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. It's not your love, it's His love. He gives it to us. We just have to share it. That's all we got to do, just share it. Receive it and share it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's the biggie. If you want to flow in the Father's love, you have to spend time with the Father. If you want to know love, you got to know the source of love, and that's God. You see, God doesn't want an occasional visit from us on Sunday or even a a devotional time. He wants to be a habitation. He wants us to be his habitation. Amen. He wants, just like we had this morning, that's what the Father desires from us, is that intimate connection in his presence. I can tell you, I have transferred from a performance-based Christian to a love-based Christian. I used to do, do, do all the time. I was missing out. I find that when I stop the doing and do the sitting and the waiting and the laying before him, rich, 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 rich. There's nothing that can take the place of that. Do you realize that what's That's what each and every one of us was born for. That's how you were created. First and foremost, to love our Father who formed and fashioned us in the womb. That's His one desire. And unfortunately, a lot of times that's the least thing that we do. We give Him a little bit of time here and a little bit of time there. But He wants to be a habitation with us. The God of the universe that created everything wants to have fellowship with you and I on an ongoing, intimate basis. How do I know when I'm getting out of balance? I've got what I call the three M's. And if you listen to me and stick to this, you'll get that later. It'll serve you well. Remember 3M, the tape company? 3M's. It's the Mary Martha measurement. I use that one a lot. Let's review the story real quick. Luke 
10, 38. Jesus and his disciples were continuing on their way to Jerusalem. And they came to a certain village where the woman named Martha came and welcomed them into her house. Her sister Mary sat at the feet of Jesus, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus. Jesus, don't you seem it's unfair that my sister sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But Jesus said to her, Martha, 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 you worry about way too many things. You're making sandwiches that I did not even order. Mary, though, has discovered the most important thing, and it will not be taken from her. Fathers today, love. Yes, you are a provider. Yes, you are a protector. But number one, you're a lover. Church, You're a lover. And we got a hurt and dying world out here that needs to see love. Because there's a whole lot of ugliness going on out here. We got to be so saturated with the Father's love that when people even get into our presence, they know something's different. That's because the love and the presence of our Father radiates from us. And the only way I know to do that is to spend time with Him. Bill Johnson says, you become what you behold. So what are you beholding today? I feel the Holy Spirit tugging me more and more when I'm sitting down in front of the television. You don't need that. You need me. Come talk to me. I'm out busy doing something. I feel his gentle tap on my shoulder. Come have some fellowship with me. wants to fellowship with me and you. As I close up today, I realized that uh, I was blessed to have a great father. He's very disciplinarian, strict, hard worker, provided. But I'm sure there's those of you out here that's bearing some heartache. Maybe you've been abused, neglected. I know there's a lot of verbal abuse kind of growing up in the era that I grew up in, the 60s there. Maybe God's let you down, or what you think He's let you down. As we close today, my heart for you is to come resolve those issues. I know it's not easy, but you're not designed to carry that hurt. You're not. That's what the Lord paid the price for on the cross that you would not have to bear that. He bore it. All he's asking is for you just to take a step his way. Faye, could you give me a little ambient music, please? So what we're going to do, we're just going to open up the altars here. I don't know what the Lord's going to do here today. He's already done enough. But maybe maybe He's tugging at your heart right now. Maybe He's bringing something up to you. Maybe a past hurt. Something.
It's an honor and a privilege. This is, I feel right at home right here. I do. It's, I've been in front of people for a lot of years. People always ask, do you get nervous? I'm like, nah, I'm here with family. I mean, we're family. If I screw up, so what? It's just, it's my time to just talk to the family. I mean, it's okay. This is what I want more than anything. It's people to come, to get healed, to have a touch from our Father who loves us, who provides for us, who's our source, who's our everything. In Him we live, move, and have our being. So God bless you today. Come, let the Father take your hurts and your pains away and let Him replace it with His love. God bless you.